My name is Barbara Webb, and I'm the Director of Development at Morven Museum and Garden. On behalf of Morven's Board of Trustees and my fellow staff, welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this very special program. On January 25th, Morven opened the Pine Barrens, a legacy of preservation, photographs by Richard Speedy. The exhibition has allowed the museum to not only showcase 32 exquisite photographs of one of the most unique ecosystems on Earth, it has also allowed us to explore the history surrounding its preservation. 1.1 million acres, or roughly one quarter of the most densely populated state in the country. In fact, the Pine Barrens is the largest surviving open space on the eastern seaboard between the northern forests of Maine and the Everglades of Florida. When all is said and done, the preservation of the Pine Barrens is the story of the enormous power of a beautifully written book, the great courage of a sitting governor, and the vigilant stewardship of its land and water by the citizens of New Jersey. Without further ado, I am delighted to present our honored guests, all uniquely qualified to speak to the title of our program, The Pine Barrens, The Past, The Politics, and The Future. First, our esteemed moderator, Michael Aaron. Michael has been a journalist since 1970. He started at NJN in 1982 and has won a number of broadcast awards, including a Mid-Atlantic Emmy Award. During his tenure, Michael has interviewed every New Jersey governor, state Supreme Court Chief Justice, and legislative leader, plus a number of presidential candidates. Michelle Byers is the Executive Director of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. Michelle joined NJCF in 1982 and has never looked back. Beginning as the coordinator of advocacy efforts in the Pine Barrens, she has spent her career building NJCF into one of the most effective land preservation organizations in the country. Carlton Montgomery is the executive director of the Pinelands Preservation Alliance, an advocacy and public education organization devoted to preserving the resources of the New Jersey Pinelands. He is deeply involved in the Pinelands Protection Program, one of the nation's most robust and successful regional land use planning initiatives. Governor Jim Florio served as governor of New Jersey from 1990 through 1994. As governor, he was responsible for signing into law the Clean Water Enforcement Act of 1990, one of the strongest environmental laws of its type in the nation. Prior to his election, Governor Florio was an eight-term member of the United States Congress. He authored the House version of the bill that eventually became known as the Superfund, as well as the Pinelands Protection Act of 1987. Governor Florio was a past chairman of the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. In 1993, he received the Profile of Courage Award from the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. John McPhee is a born and bred Princetonian. The Pulitzer Prize winning author began his career at Time Magazine, which led to his long association with The New Yorker, where he's been a staff writer since 1965. Among numerous other books, John is the author of The Pine Barrens, the seminal book published in 1968, which inspired one of the great environmental preservation movements in American history. And finally, <coughs> Governor Brendan Byrne, Governor of New Jersey and a resident of Morven from 1974 to 1982. It is not at all an understatement to say that without Brendan Byrne, the Pine Barrens as we know it today would not exist. His courageous and indeed controversial executive order of 1979 led to the placed a moratorium on all development and led to the permanent preservation of one of the most unique and environmentally sensitive places on earth. When asked what he considers his greatest legacy as governor, he says without hesitation, the Pinelands. Thank you all for graciously agreeing to participate today. It is truly an honor. Morgan would like to thank Princeton University for hosting us today in the beautiful and iconic Bakash 50. We would also like to thank the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, the Pheasant Hill Foundation, the Curtis W. McGraw Foundation, Jack Morton Exhibits, Morpeth Contemporary, the New Jersey Historical Commission, and the Friends of Morven for their support of this program and exhibition. A quick commercial. 
For those who are unfamiliar with Morven Museum and Garden, we are located a few blocks away at 55 Stockton Street. Morven is the home of Richard Stockton, one of five New Jersey signers of the Declaration of Independence, and the only house of a New Jersey signer open to the public. It was also the home of Robert Wood Johnson, as well as the official governor's mansion for five New Jersey governors. The museum's mission is to preserve the national historic landmark known as Morven by operating it as a museum and garden that educates diverse audience, audiences about its rich history and, and the cultural heritage of New Jersey. We believe today's program fits beautifully with our mission. If by chance you're not yet a friend of Morven, we encourage you to become one. An invitation to become a friend is on your seat. The Friends of Morven make possible our exhibitions, public programs, and the care of the beautiful and historic house and gardens. If you plan to visit Morven today, the museum will remain open until 5. Thank you again for joining us. At this time, I will hand the program over to our moderator, Michael Aaron. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank Morven Museum for inviting me to be here today. Say what a terrific crowd this is on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and also put in a plug for the photo exhibition of Pine Barrens photographs by Richard Speedy, who's here today. And uh, we got a chance before this gathering to have some lunch and look at his photographs at Morven and they're really beautiful. So if any of you get a chance either today or soon, I'd recommend that. Uh, we have all the people we need here for a really thorough uh, rendering of this topic. Uh, Barbara and I were supposed to have a tete-a-tete -tete to map out the strategy for the afternoon, but we missed each other, and when I got to Morven today, she said, just call on Carl Montgomery first. He'll, he'll lay the tape, set the table for us. So I don't know what she thinks you're going to say, Carlton, but would you do that, please? A good place to start in talking about the Pinelands is, is why it's so important, why we ought to care, and why we ought to get involved in trying to save um, its resources. The Pinelands, meaning that part of New Jersey that has special growth control laws, is home to the Pine Barrens ecosystem. And that ecosystem, taken as a whole, is unique on Earth. There are plants and wildlife that are now found nowhere else on Earth but in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, or that find their greatest and very soon possibly their last refuge here. The Pine Barrens really is a Noah's Ark of biodiversity. The sands of the Pinelands, the aquifer, is critical water supply, not just for people, but also for the rest of nature. The aquifer is truly the lifeblood of the region's economy and ecosystem. And it's these vast forests that have been protected that collect and hold, cleanse and sustain that water supply uh, for all of us. Yet the Pinelands is not um, protected entirely. It is mostly in private ownership. Less than half of the Pinelands is in public uh, parks and nature preserves. Most of the protection that we enjoy today is the result of laws, not public ownership. These laws are the Pinelands Protection Act and the Comprehensive Management Plan. And they're exceptional not just in New Jersey, but in the nation. It, it, they are an incredible achievement. They set strict boundaries for where development can go, how far it can go. In theory, at least, these rules apply regardless of who owns the land. They apply to the land regardless of ownership. Local zoning, you know, we're a home rule state. We're accustomed to our own town making all the decisions. In the Pinelands, it's the regional vision that controls development and conservation. And they really have prevented development of hundreds of thousands of acres of forest that otherwise would have been turned into scattered um, housing subdivisions and retirement communities and industrial sites and, and office parks. And I, I, I think it's really important to say that the way that so much of the Pine Barrens has been protected through today is a story of politics that worked. 
It started with 15 years of citizen activism. The cause was picked up by scientists who rigorously documented the incredible value of the region. And then it was political leaders, uh, whom we have with us today, who picked up the cause and they brought it to fruition against great odds and very determined opposition. Culminating in many ways with Governor Burns signing of the Pinelands Protection Act in 1979. But we cannot be complacent. Um, I think another theme of the conversation today is that the Pinelands Protection effort is vulnerable, it is a work in progress, and I personally believe it has not yet seen its most dangerous moments. Because the time will come when we really have built out all of the forests and farm fields around the Pine Barrens. And the state of New Jersey, in some collective fashion, is going to have to decide, do we break down those barriers in the interest of continued growth uh, in, in, in green fields, or do we, do we cherish and preserve this um, incredible achievement? The fact that so many of you are here today, I think the largest collection of people to talk about the Pinelands since I've been here for 15 years um, gives me great optimism that we will, in fact, cherish and preserve it. Thanks, Carl. Uh, let me just say that we're going to uh, have our discussion for roughly an hour and then open it up to the audience for questions. Um, Governor Byrne, you, uh, you said to me in an interview that's playing over in the Morgan Museum right now that of all the things you did as governor, Every one of them would have been done without you, except for this one. Uh, how did the Pine Barrens become important to you? And tell us about your executive order preserving the Pine Barrens. I didn't think I needed an executive order. I merely you finished reading John McPhee's book. <laughs> And I, and I called David Bardeen, who was my environmental uh, commissioner. I, I thought I had a very simple solution. I said, uh, stop issuing permits in the Pinelands. <laughs> I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> and after a couple of weeks, he, he called me, he came to see me, I said, and he said, I can't do this because it's unconstitutional. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay, I'll issue an executive order. And I did. Uh, it, it's the most famous executive order ever issued in New Jersey because it stopped development in a pilot. Uh, then that was challenged. And I and, and we introduced a bill, which is called the Finance Protection Act, and the uh, and the bill languished uh, because it was challenged. And uh, I would get frankly, the, the case went up to the New Jersey Supreme Court, and. Uh, I was, I was hanging, I couldn't get it moved. I couldn't get it moved, but uh, I had the executive order. And I would get calls from uh, Chief Justice Hughes. Uh, said, when are you gonna, when are you gonna uh, get a bill through? I, I, I'm trying. Uh, uh, but while, uh, while we were doing that, and I had all this pressure. Uh, the, uh, the legislature finally uh, passed the bill. And when the legislature passed the bill, I was legally out of the woods. The, the bill had a tremendous amount of opposition, tremendous amount. Uh, there was a, and, and what happened, by the way, is nobody was opposed to the Pinelands. Everybody wanted a better bill. <laughs> send this back, send this back to committee. 
and we can get a better bill. If it con if a, 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 a critical vote on the pylons was not on the bill, it was on a motion to recommit. And if it had been recommitted, it would have been dead. Are you, say, are you saying that the executive order wasn't enough to stand and wasn't legally enforceable? You needed the legislature to pass a statute? The, the, the issue was never decided by the New Jersey Supreme Court. Never decided. Well, the, the sentiment that I heard was that the court, if they had to decide, would have decided against me. But uh, Dick Hughes was... Uh, a friend of the parliament, <laughs> and and uh, who was willing to, uh, yeah, he was willing to go along as far as he could uh, with supporting the uh, the concept. So when the bill finally passed, it, it passed not on not on the bill itself, but on the motion to recommit. And as I say, I knew. Now, if I lost that motion, the pilot was dead, dead. So that was it. That was it. That was one we uh, uh, When the pilot bill finally passed, uh, I had read the famous sentence from McPhee's book, where he said something like, uh, "Nobody can do anything about." It. Of saving the planet. And that's the only time I've ever known John McPhee to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. well, let's hear if he wants to correct himself. Um, <laughs> and, and just to provide a little context, uh, there are five million acres of New Jersey, roughly, and the Pine Barrens constitutes 650,000. So we're talking about more? One million. That's what I thought, except I thought I've just heard the number 650,000 twice in, in this conversation. Oh, a million acres. Okay, so we're talking about 20% of the land mass of New Jersey being uh, warded off and protected against development first by exec executive order and then by statute. That's a lot. And that all happened about 10 years or maybe 12 after John McPhee wrote this book, which uh, was in my bookcase in my living room last night when I went looking for it. Uh, it's very brown. Uh, feels like it's practically going to fall apart in my hands. Uh, but it's quite terrific. I, when I came here in 1978 to Princeton to be the editor of New Jersey Monthly, which was housed here at the time, uh, the Pine Barrens issue was raging, and I bought this book back then, and 35 years later, John signed it for me. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, what got you interested in the Pine Barrens? The, the, the copyright is 1967-68. So you probably did the work in 66, 67. What got you interested in the Pine Barrens? I think this microphone may be as bad as the one next time. <laughs> Thank you, Brendan. <laughs> um, I started as a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine in 1965 and as a, as a result of writing a profile of a Princeton student. And a uh, Princeton student named Bill Bradley. Right. <laughs> and um, nothing was going to be assigned to me. I had to figure out what I was going to do. And it, it was a good era of long nonfiction and so on. And I looked around for ideas. And I got a number of them right then in, in the winter of 65 and so forth. And a, a Princeton High School friend of mine said, why don't you write about the Pine Barrens? And I said, the what? <laughs> and he said, it's this big area in South Jersey. And I'd gone to down ashore uh, through, you know, Castle and stuff like that, which is in the Northeastern Pines. But I really didn't know what the Pine Barrens were. And then Bob 
my friend started telling me stories and he told me stories about people he told me stories about it there's a hole in the ground down there so deep no one has ever been to the bottom of it and so everything he told me was wrong but it happened that he got me interested and I proposed this to William Shawn the editor of the New Yorker and he says oh go ahead and so that's how how much time did you spend down there what's that how much time did you spend down there to write this book in 66 probably about eight months and I would come down go down there from Princeton almost daily except when I stayed down there and in a tent that I just put up anywhere and I had a old car that I very quickly discovered that the paved roads didn't take you anywhere much that you wanted to see and just the intricate trellis of sand roads and the Pine Barrens are where the Pine Barrens are and so I took this car out on the sand roads for eight months and sold it at the end of this for ten dollars and what I would do initially was just go into the middle of the woods you know Chatsworth or wherever and drive the sand roads to the periphery and when I hit the Garden State Parkway or something like that I put a mark on the topographic map and then I take off in another direction another vector and go somewhere and and there's Fort Dix or whatever or a motel on Route 206 and and I kept marking the map and when I got done with all that after some weeks I had a periphery of interest I mean the botanical geological Pine Barrens go from roughly Asbury Park to Philadelphia to Cape May I mean north of the end of the Cape May Peninsula and I wanted to see what what it was that I wanted to write about this this wild open land and so that's how I did it we got this circle and then dwelt there in thereafter Governor Florio you were in Congress I believe in the late 70s you weren't still in the legislature you were in Congress when Brendan Byrne was struggling at the state level to preserve the Pine Barrens and you were representing a district in South Jersey what was the political landscape around that issue and at what point did you come on board thank you let me just give a little bit of history and I see enough gray hair in the audience that maybe somebody remember some of this but obviously John's book lifted the level of awareness of the significance of the Pine Barrens from the nation and at that time during the Nixon administration which ended in 1974 76 really when he left but prior to that you may recall that he had what he called an energy independence movement and as a result of that there was a great desire to have drilling which continues in some circles have drilling and drilling off the coast of New Jersey was very enthusiastically received by people this is before casino gaming Atlantic City was really in bad bad shape and the proposal to go and have offshore drilling was very consequential I mean things were really happening people from Louisiana were coming up getting ready for drilling platforms helicopter pads were being created and there was an awareness and some seriousness of concern about pipelines going from what would be oil rigs off the Atlantic coast over to the refineries on the Delaware going right through the Pinelands area it was even as part of that whole initiative for energy independence the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was actually doing preliminary surveys in the Pinelands to deal with nuclear facilities so there was this awareness of the potential after learning about the fragility of the area the potential for desecration of that area so what we did was decide that we needed some federal authorization to create a new concept the concept of a federal reserve within which a state in the reserve would be able to be authorizing measures such as the measures that Brendan took and set up a regulatory pattern set up a commission set up a plan to be able to go and make sure you had protective features Brendan said quite correctly it was very contentious 
Uh, as a matter of fact, some people may recall there was actually a, a movement to secede. The southern portion of the state would secede from the state because they were going to steal our water. And there were a whole bunch of other initiatives that were being talked about. But we were able to get the legislation through in Washington, in large measure because of the Carter administration's enthusiasm for rejecting the previous administration's policies, particularly <laughs> on the energy side. And we had uh, Cecil Andrus, who was a former governor in uh, Idaho, who was the commissioner of uh, the uh, Secretary of the Interior. Brendan and I took him for a helicopter tour um, over the area. He was astounded. He, this can't be New Jersey. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was very helpful, and the administration was very helpful in getting the bill passed. And so what we did was get the bill passed, and then Brendan obviously uh, did the good things, the hard things in New Jersey. And it was interesting that the executive order, I mean, a lot of the legalistic people said it was not authorized. But the fact of the matter, it did the job. Held the, the, the status quo until we got the legislation through. And since that time, of course, we've uh, been able to make sure and it's been, it's been ups and downs, there's been some periods where there's a little less um, stringency, a little less uh, appropriate regulation there. But I think for the most part, the people in New Jersey now have signed on to the proposition, this was a good thing. And the easy way to evaluate it is to think for a moment what that area would look like today, but for all the regulations that we've been able to put into effect. It would be concreted over, we'd have housing developments, and the, the intensity of the concerns about the aquifer, as was said, the largest freshwater aquifer on the East Coast, source of drinking water, already is under stress. If we had not had the protections provided by the Pilots Protection Act and the state initiatives, we would have serious, serious problems beyond what we have at this point. Governor, it says uh, in the intro that you, you, you had passed uh, a bill in Congress in 1987. Is that, was it as late as that? I mean, the, the government was before that? In the 70s. In the, that's what I thought. Uh, sort of in conjunction with what was happening at the state level. Uh, you got the pump in, into the mic. But to, to tell you, to tell, I, I want you to understand how much of a fight this was. The Pie Lands Commission consisted of how many people? 16? But, but the Secretary of Interior had one appointment uh, to that commission. It could be a critical appointment. The last year I was in office, I, just, I, I, I knew that my appointee to that job was going to be replaced. So I appointed Ray Bateman, who I had lost, who I lost the uh, gubernatorial election to me, and it was as good a Republican as there is in New Jersey to this day. I appointed him. Uh, the day after, uh, the day after I left office, and Ronald Reagan's Secretary of Interior, James Watt was in charge of the data form. He replaced Ray Baby. That's how, that's how partisan it was. Michelle Byers, uh, uh, you've been executive director of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation since 1982, is that correct? 99. Uh, 99, okay, but you've been an advocate for the Pine Barrens since when? 1980. 1980. What got you involved and what's your role been? Well, I was one very lucky person. I was like many hundreds of people, some of who I recognize in this room, who got out of college and landed in the Pine Barrens right at the time when the CMP was getting written. It was a really exciting time. Uh, and we all pretty much immersed ourselves in the Pine Barrens. So, you know, as everyone's been talking about John's book, um, I think if you have a passion for a place, there's something that actually inspired you, something that really got you involved and set you off on a, on a track. And the Pine Barrens was that for me. So I spent the first few years working hard on conservation, but I also spent a lot of time driving through the Pine Barrens, sometimes at night with the headlights off for fun, uh, trying to get lost in the woods because it was just such a vast area. It would really be fun to just go and not know where you were and then eventually find your, your, where you were. 
Um, I got to know a lot of people. I would go to Albert Hall and play the fiddle on Saturday nights. And I got to meet um, Amal Brown, one of the characters in John's book, who actually was hitchhiking all the time, and I would end up picking him up, taking him home from Albert Hall. And I was, I was really enamored with him. I thought, oh, this must be a really interesting guy. So I, when I dropped him off one night, I said, why is this called Hog Wallow? And Amal said, I don't know. I guess there were some pigs here sometime. <laughs> I was really disappointed with that answer. <laughs> Governor Florio, did you want to jump in? What are the Pineys really like? <laughs> uh, I was going to ask that question. <laughs> uh, but go ahead, John. What are the Pineys really like? <laughs> Let's go back, Brendan. You and I have been down there before. They're terrific people. Let's go back and see them. They're wonderful. They were so terrific, you know, when you go around and, and, and when they finally understood what I was trying to do, and I'd go into the general store and they're all sitting on the radiator there, and uh, a radiator cover, and uh, you'd talk to a guy and you'd say his name was Charlie Leak and he grew blueberries, and, and then you'd go out to the blueberry patch with Charlie Leak and, and it just keep multiplying like that. And, uh, I have huge affection for them. So anytime you want to go down, let's go. Are they still there? Are, in the uh, abundance, that, well, I don't know about abundance, there, there were only 15 people per square mile down there at one point, but are the Pineys still down there the way they were in the 60s? Carlton, maybe you can answer that. I think that it's that aspect of John's book, of the Pine Barrens book, that has probably changed the most over the last 40 years. Um, most of the places look the same, but many of the people have either passed on or have changed their lifestyles. We are, there are more people in and around the Pine Barrens, and there are very few who make their living as a kind of subsistence living off the land um, as time goes on. Um, there are still families, however, uh, the cranberry growers. Um, there are hunting clubs with people with long roots in the region. So there's still many people, uh, despite the great influx of the suburban population to everything around it, there are still people in the Pinelands who have um, the kind of history and roots and affection for the region uh, that they had at the time the book was written. Uh, of course, the difficulty is that most of them don't necessarily like what I do as a preservationist. In many cases, there is still a, a uh, a cultural distrust or a, um, uh, an economic distrust of the conservation effort among some, among some of that uh, community. Uh, now that the Pinelands laws are there, they're so stringent and they can really give people trouble. I'd like to pick up on that in a second, but first I'd like to read a passage from John's book, if I could. Uh, in the late 1930s and early 1940s, a graduate student from the English Department of Indiana University went around the Pine Barrens collecting stories. He was motivated in part by the somewhat melancholy knowledge that the development of broadcasting was going to wash away much of this part of regional American life. The student, Herbert N. Halpert, is now a professor of English at Memorial University in Newfoundland. His doctoral dissertation was called Folk Tales and Legends from the New Jersey Pines. He dated each story he heard. On June 19, 1941, a piney named Charles Grant told Halpert, quote, I heard old Cracky Wainwright say he seen two black snakes come together and they was both mad. He seen they was going to fight, so he stood and watched them. The one got a hold of the other one's tail and began to swallow it, and the other one got a hold of the other one's tail and began to swallow him. He said they kept on fighting and swallowing one another until both snakes were swallowed. There wasn't any snake left there at all. <laughs> Remember that story, Jim? Happens in the Pine Barrens still. <laughs> still happens in the Pine Barrens. Uh, all, the, uh, all these people uh, who were objecting were landowners, I assume, or homeowners, property owners. Was there any talk of compensation 
Was there any compensation? Anybody? Yes. Uh, the, the, I understand, and I understood this from the beginning, that what the, the Pilots Protection Act did was unfair to some people. It would have been ideal if we could have bought the Pilot. Ideal. It's not an ideal country. Uh, and we can't buy everything. We, uh, we, we try to uh, be fair and we try to, we have a definite program for acquiring land in a pilot as a priority. But we can't, we can't afford it. Anybody else on that question of compensation? Not wanting to get too technical, but there is actually an important feature of the Pinelands program that isn't talked about very much, and that's its transfer of development rights program. Again, probably the leading transfer of development rights program in the nation, where people whose land is most heavily regulated are given essentially like a security, which they can sell to people who are required by the regulations to buy these securities in order to do certain kinds of development in the growth zones. Remember, the Pinelands isn't all preservation. About a third of the Pinelands region is designated for development and growth, for people to come and live and have shopping malls and offices and all those things, and about two thirds for conservation. So there is um, uh, another system built in, in addition to just outright acquisition by the state, to provide compensation for those who are most heavily regulated. And it's, been a, it's really been a very successful program. I think it's important to understand the evolution over the years of how people regard the Pinelands. The Pinelands, by the way, you probably could not get legislation like this passed today. I mean, the most significant thing that's good planning is that the towns were required to bring their zoning into conformity with the overall plan. So this truly is regionalization. As you can appreciate, that was very contentious at the very beginning. And we have two former executive directors here, and they can come up and tell you long, long stories about very contentious meetings, long into the night, bordering on violence at some point. It was interesting when President, uh, when Governor McGreevy came into office, he asked me if I would go back because there were some administrative problems there and would chair the Pinelands Commission. I did. And I was really struck by how over that period of time, from the 70s, late 70s, up until 2000, that the, the world had changed. The local leaders who had been very acrimonious in their views about um, the Pinelands, were now regarding it as a help. They regard the staff people as assistance to them. So it was a good thing to see that this evolution of support for an idea that was very contentious. Are there still some people unhappy? Yes. But I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of people, even in the region, much less in the state, appreciate the fact that what was done there was something that's of great value to the resources of the state and to the well-being of the state. Michelle, uh, what's your view on what Carlton uh, said a moment ago about 30% uh, of the Pinelands area being uh, open to a certain level of development and two-thirds being uh, basically protected and preserved? Uh, what, what, how does that region, as of those million acres, how does it look today compared to how it looked 30 years ago, and, and is there some kind of development encroachment happening under our very eyes? Well, it looks a lot the same, uh, thankfully, uh, because of the Pinelands Plan. Uh, I'd say the region, just like Governor Byrne said, uh, would, would be completely covered with senior citizen housing developments and, and development spread across the whole thing if it hadn't been for the plan. There's no question about it. Um, there are definitely, uh, because it is a hybrid, because it is a regional plan and, and not all the land, at least at this point in time, can be preserved at once, there are numerous threats um, on the edges. Carlton can speak to some of the specific ones today. Um, and you know, the only way to address it really at this point, uh, because I don't see the, the ability to get the Pinelands plan stronger right now, uh, just as it would be difficult to get the, ha the Pinelands Act passed today, it's also equally difficult to strengthen. Does it, need to be, does it need to be strengthened? I think it does in certain areas of the planning area, yes. And also, even within the preservation area, there are, are, are rules, regulations, and programs that need strengthening. 
Um, we have quite a few th threats even within the preservation area. Uh, so I think you know, it's really critical that we get additional funding for open space and farmland preservation in this state so we can continue to acquire lands. We've been so fortunate uh, because of the Garden State Preservation Trust funds that we have been able to buy out and in other words, you could call it compensation, I guess, but we were able to uh, acquire s some really significant tracts of land uh, because of the, the transfer development rights program. So in the early days, many landowners sued the, uh, the state of New Jersey, but they had large tracts, they were speculators, and they knew they would never receive the speculative value of that land, so they were able to get their credits uh, sold and they got money from their credits. Then they're sitting there with the land um, and then we've, we've been able to buy some significant tracts of land that have had the, the, these, those credits severed. Um, I have a couple stories about that, but I don't want to hog the microphone, so. John McPhee, um, you wrote the book in 67, 68. Did you stay in touch with the subject beyond that? And were you, uh, how present were you when Brendan Byrne a decade, decade later uh, was going through his gyrations to uh, preserve what you had basically discovered? Well, I wasn't, uh, you know, with, present with him in uh, any of these negotiations or anything, but it, it happened that Bill Dwyer, who used to write for the Trenton Tonian and Trenton Times, uh, took me over more than one time to play tennis with Brendan. And we played tennis together for a long time, and we both left Canada, and we were tennis partners. We rented a tennis court in the winter, so I was attendant to uh, the discussion, but it was uh, but generally when I was trying to help him hit the ball. <laughs> and and, and uh, uh, as far as the pines go, I went down there a lot with, uh, my family and with other people and across the years, uh, not so much in recent years, uh, there was a time when William Least Heat Moon came to talk to my students here at Princeton. And he was stayed with us a couple of nights. And so uh, Warren Elmer and I took him in a canoe down to the Pine Barrens and put the canoe in the Oswego River to paddle this American Indian down through the pines. And um, it happened that there was a terrific lot of rain and, it was, and the, the Oswego River was really flooded. The water was up in the trees and everything else. We put the canoe in the river and we got a hundred yards and the canoe rolls over with, with our guest and, and uh, so on and so forth, and, and we, we, we had sandwiches with us, and I remember getting out on some hummock and say, saying to Heat Moon and, and Warren, eat those sandwiches, they were sopping wet, but we had no other food. And uh, anyway, I did a lot of things like that through those years. Were you, were you called to testify before the legislature when they considered a bill? No. Okay. Would you? Would I have? Yeah. What was I going to say? Or what am I going to say? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Okay. Uh, it's, not, it's not important now. No, it's true. Uh, Carlton just said, read the book. Well, the thing is that, that everything that, that I knew about the Pine Barrens that I thought would be worth saying to anybody was in the book or you know, writing his selection. And, and so I think I would have said something like that. Governor Florio, uh, uh, you, uh, you and Governor Byrne talked about the level of passion uh, on both sides of this issue back then in the late 70s. Is there a lingering resentment over the Pinelands Act uh, today in that part of New Jersey, or is it accepted as uh, a fact of life? Governor Florian. Well, I would say there is no resentment. I mean, are there some people would have liked to have made speculative profits off of land, the answer is yes. But I think it's fairly to say if you did polling at this point, the vast majority of people in the state support the initiative. Even the people in the South Jersey support the initiative. So I think it's evolved to the point now there is mass support. Governor. I remember, I remember reading in the paper where some guy 
said if Brandenburg comes down here to the finance, I'm going to punch him in the nose. <laughs> so I went down. <laughs> and he put his arm around me and we can work this out. <laughs> That's what happened. Why do you consider it, uh, or do you consider it, your greatest accomplishment in two terms as governor, during which there were many accomplishments? The reason I, the reason I think it's the greatest accomplishment is not that it's the most important thing I did. And uh, uh, I'm going to be remembered, I know I'm going to be remembered for the income tax. <laughs> But the, but the Pinelands Preservation, uh, which I'm not sure anybody else would have done, uh, was something which I thought of, I read the book, I thought that it was something worth doing. I don't think anybody else would have, uh, would have paid attention to it. I really don't, because there was no in indication that any other governor had ever paid attention to it, or that any other governor would. Uh, and so, to do something that changed the way, New I, I did a lot of things that changed New Jersey. We wouldn't have legalized gambling in New Jersey today, if it weren't for me. And no other governor would have done it. No other governor. Anyway, uh, the, the answer to your question is, that it was something that changed New Jersey, changed New Jersey for the good, and I did it. How long did it take from reading the book? <laughs> How long did it take from reading the book to getting the deed done? A couple of years? I think it was after I finished reading the book, I called David Bardeen, and I said, stop issuing permits. So it happened that, that quick? Yeah. Okay. Governor Florio. Well, it's interesting. I don't know how many people here are from South Jersey, but if you want a graphic example of the significance of the Pinelands, drive down Route 73, come to the Berlin Circle. One side of the Berlin Circle, no Pinelands. Gordy, very unattractive. The other side, pristine. That's the Pinelands. So if you had no Pinelands, you'd have the wrong side of Route 73. So anybody can stand there, take a list, look at that, and you'll see dramatically what the consequences are. On that note, Carlton. I also, by the way, I also stopped the development of the, the I stopped uh, the turnpike extension, which would have meant today uh, concrete from New Brunswick to Tom's River. Uh, it's funny, uh, uh, John McPhee mentioned in the book that uh, there was an expectation that there would be eight or ten roads, the equivalent of the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, running through that corridor if development hadn't have been slowed. Um, speak, to, speak to that. I said not not to mention the jet port in, in those days. It was a, I mean, supersonic aircraft were were uh, in the conversation and, and existing, and and they were going to build a jet port with uh, run, the runways would would go four ways, a great big square, six miles each, and all the land inside, and a new city there. Uh, the Garden State Parkway would be either rerouted or a diversion in it would be put sort of in and under the terminal and all this is in the uh, where in the in the in the in the uh, pig, yeah yeah the pygmy pine forest which is you know where the where the species of pitch pine and so on grow only the height of a person then and, and anyway that in this vast thing known as the plains down there they were going to put this jet port Carlton uh, I overheard you at lunch Talking about a Walmart in the Pinelands, is there such a thing? Yes, this is a, an example of the kind of threats that I think the Pinelands 
most faces today in the immediate sense, in the year after year, day after day sense. We really have two, I would say, two fundamental issues. One of them is making exceptions. You know, we make an exception every year or every six months. Before long, the whole program, the whole plan, the whole vision begins to lose credibility and is fundamentally weakened. Um, this case of a Walmart to be constructed in Tom's River um, is one where uh, there's a jurisdictional complication I won't get into, but it's in the Pinelands National Reserve. It's governed by the Pinelands Comprehensive Management Plan, at least in theory. This is one where the state of New Jersey denied a permit for this development based on a few things, but principally the protection of rare species habitat, of the northern pine snake, a threatened species in New Jersey. Um, and uh, the governor um, was quoted shortly afterwards saying, we'll find a way around it. Well, not six or eight months later, that permit was issued for exactly the same development. Um, and I'm sorry, the, uh, Governor Christie said, find a way around it, is that what he said? Yeah, he was quoted by the Asbury Park Press saying, we will find a way around it. Um, and that happened. Uh, so it's an example of the role of politics it's an example of the difficulty that an agency like the DEP or the Pinelands Commission has in enforcing its rules every single day against all comers who want to do something different. Um, and it's why we rely on these, these government agencies um, to not just, you know, we can't just pass a law and say, ah, the Pinelands Protection Act, it's done, we're good. Um, it takes the work every day, uh, and some of the people who do that work every day are, are here today. Um, that kind of Chinese water torture uh, is, a, is a potential threat to the Pinelands. Is, is, uh, is the composition of the Pinelands Commission today friendly to Pinelands preservation? You're really putting me on the spot, aren't you? <laughs> I would say it's a mix. I think there are at most one or two who, would, who are hostile um, in, a, in a basic sense to the Pinelands program. There are several who are very enthusiastic about their statutory mission as commissioners. And then there are some who are really there to do what they are told by uh, perhaps a county that has appointed them, perhaps by the governor. And so my worry is that today the Pinelands Commission um, is in a state where it's very difficult for it to do its job as an independent executive agency. In New Jersey, we have this very powerful governorship, and we tend to hire bossy governors. <laughs> that works out beautifully when the bossy governor is doing what you want them to do. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily work out as well, and, and governors have a hard time with the idea of an independent agency, one that has a, a statutory mission that they are supposed to pursue, regardless of how the political winds are blowing today. The strength of the Pinelands Commission and the reason it has been so successful for so many years is that it actually was run as a very bipartisan or nonpartisan science-based program for many years. And I think the biggest worry that we advocates have today is that that independence, that ability to look at issues as scientific and engineering issues first and foremost, and then work out the politics, um, has been eroded over time. And the commission is at a, a kind of a key juncture in whether it can reassert its independence and set the agenda for the Pinelands in the coming decade. Michelle, what's your view on the Pinelands Commission today? Wait, wait till the mic comes your way. Oh. I think Carlton is exactly right, uh, and I really think that the way that we need to address it is to look at maybe not um, past politics and future, but people, places, and passion. I think we really need to reach out and engage the entire state of New Jersey and what a wonderful resource we have and make sure that people understand it, but more than that, that they love it. Um, if, if people don't get into the Pinelands and develop a personal relationship with it. You mean they have to turn their headlights off and go in at night like you do? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and a lot more. <laughs> um, I think that that really is the key to the long-term preservation of the region. I think those personal relationships are everything. Um, to, you know, having 
had the, the really the, uh, the blessing of, of working in the Pinelands as long as I did uh, and being involved for so long. I met so many great people and developed so many relationships. And talk about evolution. Uh, one uh, relationship I developed early on was with Garfield DeMarco, who was a staunch opponent of the Pinelands Act. Uh, hated government. He was a big time cranberry grower. Grower, head of the Republican Party in Burlington County, a uh, very powerful man, and he actually was a very interesting man as well and a generous man. I got to be good friends with him. And I did some research for Barrow Collins's book on the Pine Barrens, and so I had to interview him. He basically said to me, look, you know, when it gets tough and people get thirsty, the water is either going to come from the Pine Barrens or, or they're going to build that Tox Island Dam. Um, and he, he was very clear about that. Uh, but it, what happened with him is, as his life evolved and as the Pinelands plan got implemented and things changed, he called me and because we had a friendship, it, when, when he wanted to sell his farm, basically stick it to Ocean Spray and the local cranberry growers there, he called me and uh, offered to sell uh, for preservation. And that was a, a tough sell. Uh, it was a tough sell all around because he was Republican and the new governor coming in, McGreevy, basically did not want to spend a dime in the Pine Barrens, let alone give it to Garfield and Marco. So we had a very tough sell and my board of trustees balked big time. This was $11 million. We never use private money to buy land. We always use other people's money. What do you mean my organization has to cough up $11 million for this property? It was, it was really hard. And that's where John came in again because we went to John and said, you, you know, are you, would you be willing to give our board autographed copies of your book to help spur them on <laughs> to preserve this 11,000 acres, or 10,000 acre tract in the Pine Barrens that we were looking to buy? And John said, well, sure I'll do it, but not until they're 100% committed to the project. Well, and that helped, actually. We did raise $6 million, and that was enough to execute the option and buy the property. Uh, and Garfield could not be prouder of this legacy. And in fact, there's an area on the property that's called the A.R. DeMarco Cranberry Meadows Natural Area after his family. And he is absolutely thrilled at that this is returned to nature. And there's another really ironic thing about it. When Garfield had the land, I, he, the Federal um, Natural Resource Conservation Service spent millions of dollars to put in irrigation ditches to make it a cranberry bog. And then when we bought the land in, the, in uh, 2003, the, the Natural Resources Conservation Service spent millions of dollars to us to take all those pipes back out again and make it a wetland again. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's all about relationships and I think that it's really, that's the key. This, everyone get out and love this place. Take your kids there. Get uh, the young generation out into the pines so that they will make sure it stays protected. I'll be in big trouble if I don't introduce my family. <laughs> my wife, Ruthie, my son, Tom, my granddaughter, Aaron, my daughter-in-law, Barbara, my granddaughter, Kelly, and my grandson, Brendan Thomas Byrne III. <laughs> We're just about out of time, but uh, I want to ask each of you one final question and ask you to keep your answer concise, and we'll just go down the line, starting with Michelle. Um, it's been, let's see, 22, 32, about 35 years since Governor Byrne uh, did what he did. Let's project forward another 35 years. What will the Pine Barrens be like in 35 years? Briefly, quickly, right down the line. Uh, starting with Michelle. Well, I'm optimistic, and I think it's going to look a lot like it does today, uh, but there will also be uh, perhaps a more restoration done. Um, agriculture will be more conducive to natural systems than it is today. Uh, so I'm looking at a, a very positive, bright future for the pines, but I'm always optimistic. Uh, so hopefully I'll be around at that time and I can go back and check. Go to Florio. Well, if merit counts for anything, 
uh, and goodwill counts for anything, we should have protection going forward. Because intellectually, we're all concerned about climate change. We're all concerned about the availability of water. So on the merits, this is something that everyone should be behind. But it's going to take leadership. Leadership to bring to everyone's attention the significance of this area, this very fragile area. And if we get the leadership, the public should follow. Governor Byrne, uh, the Pine Barrens in another 35 years. You know, there's a uh, poem reproduced by John McPhee in his book uh, that reads, God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. That's my guideline. <laughs> That's a hard one to follow. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist. Um, I would say I have no idea what the pilots is going to look like in 35 years. The one thing I do know, and I would just flip it a little bit from what Governor Florio said, the one thing I do know is that it will not survive without the, particularly the people of New Jersey in some real and concrete and ongoing ways demanding that it be protected. I think the, the leaders will follow the public opinion at least as much as the public opinion will follow the leaders in this coming era. And um, so again, I would urge, as Michelle did, everybody here who doesn't already live and explore the Pinelands every day, as some of you do, come and visit it with us, with Michelle and I, we'll get lost together, we'll make sure that you survive, however. Um, uh, the experience is worth a thousand pictures. <laughs> John McPhee, you, you started this whole movement with your journalism. Uh, and as a journalist, I tip my hat to you, one of the great reporters of this country over the past half century. Um, What's your hope for this region in 35 years? Well, I was down there in January with Carlton. We roamed all over the woods, all over the woods that the place after place after place in the sand roads that you know that I'd written about in uh, in the 1960s. And uh, the most significant change in those places was right in the dead center in Hog Wallow. Where, where old Fred Brown's shanty had been replaced by a new cranberry bog. And if that's the change, I think it's encouraging. That that's all that we really saw. And I would extrapolate 35 years from now that it'll pretty much look like that then. All right, on that note, uh, we're going to be done. We uh, podcast journalists like to look for a takeaway out of a meeting. The takeaway out of this meeting is get lost in the time. <laughs>